So let's start with the clauses. So the first clause of John 1.1 1, 1 is right here. So that's, that's the A clause. All right. And so I'm going to do the B clause is the longest right here. That's clause B. And here is clause C. All right. All right. So there are your clauses uh, for John 1.1. 1, 1. So, NRK in halagos, in the beginning was the word. That's A. B, kai halagos ein prosthon theon, and the word was with God. And C, kai theos ein halagos, and the word was God. Now, let's look at each clause. Let's make sure that we have a solid understanding of grammar. And let's make sure a single sentence can only answer so many questions. This single sentence is not left alone. This single sentence exists in an entire book. And so the, the challenge is always to accurately handle what is in the sentence, but then to see how it relates to the entire context. The primary problem with cultic, unorthodox interpretation is simple. The demonstration of the truthfulness of the orthodox understanding is found in the fact that I will use the same method of exegesis, interpretation, and translation for John 1.1 1, 1, that I use for any other verse in the Gospel of John, including verses that simply say that Jesus went from one place to another, verses that say uh, that Jesus waited a certain number of days before going to raise Lazarus, for example. And, and the, the point is that the demonstration of divine truth will be found in its consistency throughout the text. And what you discover is that the people who try to come up with novel ways of looking at texts like this very often can't even translate another text in the Gospel of John, let alone anywhere else in the New Testament. I have encountered innumerable Jehovah's Witnesses who could tell you an amazing amount of stuff about a verse like this. Take them two chapters later and they're lost have no idea. Very few of them can actually teach and preach through the entirety of the Gospel of John or Mark or Luke or Matthew, for that matter. So, in the beginning was the Word. Now, let's start with the beginning. So, NRK. And the vast majority of scholars will recognize that these are the same words that begin Genesis 1 1 in the Greek Septuagint. And so there is a understanding that John is referring to the same beginning that Genesis does. There are others who would want to try to limit this and say, well, it, you know, it could be the beginning of the gospel, it could be uh, the beginning of God's work with Israel, or whatever else it might be. But the fact that these are the same words used back in Genesis in the Greek translation is very, very important. Let's go ahead and look at Logos for a second. Ha Logos. Logos as a Greek term has what is called a wide semantic domain. Semantic domain. What does that mean? Well, there are some words that are extremely uh, narrow in their semantic domains. They will have a very small range of possible meaning. And then there are other words that have a very large range of possible meaning. And what you have to do by looking at the form they're used in, the context, things like parallels that the author might provide, where here in this large domain is the author putting my particular usage here? Logos has a very wide semantic domain. 
it can simply mean things and matters and, and all sorts of stuff. Now, you will be told, if you pick up any commentary, um, that Logos has a great deal to do with Greek philosophy. And it does. The Logos is the rational principle. The rational principle in numerous of the leading Greek philosophers of the day. And so you'll find this in Philo, a contemporary, and, and so on and so forth. However, if this came from the Greek Septuagint, we also need to realize that the Logos likewise is found in the, the Memra, uh, the Devar, the words of Yahweh. Well, there's, it's in the Old Testament, and then there has developed in the uh, intertestamental period this idea of the word of God, the revelation of God, the speech of God. You'll find this in Psalm 119 and other places like that. And so you'll find argumentation in the commentaries as to where John is deriving this. I think you always have to default first and foremost to the Old Testament, to the Hebrew scriptures, or in this case, the Greek translation which of course is what John's going to be using all the way through anyways, uh, as your primary source, you can give a nod to the Logos and Greek philosophy you want, but to think that John is going to make that his primary source, I think is questionable as popular as that might be. Now, here is our verb, ain, ain. Predicate nouns follow linking verbs. There are two primary uh, verbs of being in Greek. You have uh, aimi and you have ginomai, which very often is found the aorist in agenita. And you can see agenita right here, for example. There's agenita right there. These are the verbs of being and in this instance, what's very fascinating is John very carefully in the prologue uses this form when he's talking about the Logos, and then he uses again at all when he's talking about anything else. So all things were made through him. So when he's not talking about the Logos, he uses again at all, which would have a point of origin concept to it. This does not have a point of origin concept. What do I mean by that? It's not, it's not saying the word began to exist in the past. Why? Because it's in the imperfect. Now, the simplest way in the Greek language to express an action called the aorist. Okay? The aorist is sort of your, your default. It, it seems to be the uh, the most ancient way in which uh, the Greek language expressed an, an action. So the aorist frequently is a point action in the past. Sometimes it's, it's just an action and it's not really defined. Um, a present will have a emphasis upon continuous action ongoing as you're speaking. The imperfect, which is what we're looking at here, is continuous action in the past, which can have different aspects to it. And so you can have um, culminative imperfects and, and, and cumulatives and ingressives and iteratives. Um, so you could say, uh, he used to teach in the temple wherein what you're saying is he would teach the temple, but he wasn't teaching the temple 24 seven. He was teaching in the temple a certain number of days or weeks something like that. But that was a, a regular pattern that he was doing. Okay. Um, or in John six, uh, John uses the imperfect uh, to say that Jesus was saying to them over and over again, repetitively, you're not able to come to me unless the father enables you to come. 
so these are different ways in which the language can express various actions. And what's fascinating is you'll notice in the second clause, there's your ain, and the third clause, there's your ain. So when the logos is being discussed in relationship to the father and the arche, the beginning, the imperfect is being used, which does not point to a point of origin as far back as you want to push the arche, the logos already was. Okay? The logos already was. As far back as you want to push this, however you interpret arche, the logos is in existence. So what does this tell us? What does the first clause tell us about the logos? The logos is eternal. The Logos is not a created being. The Logos has not come into existence at a point in time. The Logos has existence. We haven't defined it yet, uh, but the Logos was already in existence in the beginning. The Logos is eternal. So the second phrase, B, the B clause here, is the longest of the three. And the word was with God. So we have the same verb now. And so if this is an eternal relationship, then this is an eternal relationship. The logos, logos has an article. Here is the word the, ha logos, just as you had an article here. Ha logos. And by the way, uh, we will have to, We'll, we'll expand upon this in a moment. But when you have a linking verb, and ain is functioning this way, and you have a nominative, and you have a second nominative, as we'll have in the third clause. In Greek, the article tells you which word is the subject. So if you had God is light, all right? In Greek, the Greek language can tell you the difference between saying all of God is all of light or God, the subject, is light and light's the predicate nominative. How? Through the use of the article. So if neither noun, nominatives, remember in Greek you have uh, what are called cases. In the Greek language, you will be taught two, uh, two different ways. I was taught what was called the 8K system. Uh, I now teach the 5K system. What's the difference between the two? How, has Greek changed? No. In the, the 5K system is based upon the actual forms in the language. The 8K is based upon the uses of those forms in the language. There are five forms, so it's easier to learn it that way and then learn the subcategories, but I didn't learn in the easiest grammar, uh, so, so there you go. So you have the nominative, you have the genitive, you have the dative, and then underneath the dative, the subcategories of locative and instrumental. You have the accusative, and you have the vocative. Now, the nominative is the case of the subject. The genitive is an oblique case, possession, it can also have categories of direction, directionality, uh, partitive, genitives, things like that. The dative is the indirect object when it's just being a dative. But then that same form can be locative, location, and instrumental, means by which something happens. I think one of the clearest examples of this is in uh, when Paul says, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. It doesn't mean God as a person was in Jesus reconciled the world. It was God by means of Jesus, instrumental, 
reconciling the world unto himself. That's a good example of it. The accusative, which is what we will have right here, the famous, after my debate with Joe Ventilacion, the famous ton tayon <laughs> is just simply the accusative uh, form of theos. And then the vocative was, you, you can sort of, sort of draw a line there because there are very few pure vocative forms in the New Testament. And most scholars recognize that the vocative was passing away uh, at the, during the Koine period, uh, during the first century. And so it was more of a classical thing and it was, it was being the function of the vocative was being taken over by the nominative as we'll see in John 20, 28. All right. Um, so these are your cases. Uh, and so ha is just simply the singular nominative article. So ha, logos, tu, lagu, to, lago, ton, logon, etc., etc. So you can, that's called uh, declining. And then you have the plural forms. So uh, you, you'd have hoi if it's a masculine, and then there are feminine forms and there are neuter forms. And this is why it's best to know English before you start trying to learn Greek, <laughs> because once you start getting into all those, uh, all those forms, it can, be, it can be somewhat challenging to English speakers. So with that, um, so we have, and the word was, and so we can see this is a nominative. It's coming before the linking verb, so it's the subject. And the word was, then following this, we have what is called, there you go, pros ton theon. When you have prepositions, you have prepositional phrases, prepositional phrases in English, under the table. Um, these are frequently uh, providing location, direction of movement. Uh, they're very, very important. Now, pros ton theon could be translated as face to face with, in relationship to. You've got to do something with it here because we're being told that the Logos was, so there is existence. The Logos is in existence with God. And God here is articular. What does articular mean? Articular means has an article. Has an article. That's all. Um, most of the time, theos is ha theos and tu theu and now, there will find places where, because you have a preposition, the author doesn't bother with the article. And one thing you've got to understand, that, that you will be led astray if you do not hear what I'm saying right now. The Greek article and the English article are not the same things. There are very few who teach and read Greek coming from an English background who have a sound, functional, natural uh, capacity and ability with the Greek article. The only reason that I have any facility with it is because one of the projects, again, the advantage of doing this in college instead of seminary, I had time to do projects, research papers, things like that, learn the language more slowly, memorize vocabulary better. If you can't do that, then you're not going to have an understanding of the range of uses of articles, when they can function as relative pronouns, how they're functioning in sentences. You can always tell when someone is, is trying to live read something and they don't know about this because, well, sometimes there's nothing you can do. You're, you're going to end up jumping around. But sometimes they'll end up just completely missing something because the article that goes with the noun is seven words one direction or the other from where it's supposed to be, normally before, obviously. Um, Frequently, it just takes the place of the noun, becomes a pronoun. The Greek article is rich, it is deep, and hence is easily misrepresented. 
easily misrepresented by those who have an agenda in trying to insert something. And so we'll see that in the third clause here. Um, but just be aware that's coming. So the first clause in the beginning was the word, the word's eternal. And the word was with God. So the word has been differentiated from Tom Theon. All right. There is a relationship between the Logos and Ton Theon. That's, we've only gotten through two clauses. We're not even at the end of the sentence yet. All right? So, with that said, John 1.1c. 1, 1, Let's read it in Greek word order. Kai Theos ein ha Logos. So, and God was the word. Now, if you encounter anybody who says, and God was the word. You immediately know you are listening to someone who cannot actually read Greek. Just that bluntly, I got to put that, that bluntly. Why? Well, like that eighth grade teacher. What if, what if we put an article in there. Kai ha theos ein ha logos. What if we did that? Or what if we take that out? And what if this wasn't here? Kai theos ein logos. Those would be equivalent statements. They would be equivalent statements. And what they would do is they would make these two nominatives, because notice, logos is a nominative, the os is a nominative. They are in the subject case with a linking verb. And so if you take the article out or put an article before both of them, it turns the linking verb into an equal sign. And so all of God becomes all the Logos. All the Logos becomes all of God. They become interchangeable. They become interchangeable. So when people tell you, well, you know, um, there's no article before Theos. And so um, that means it's a God. That's someone who can't read Greek. That's someone who can't read Greek because they don't understand this construction. Because if there was an article, it would be saying everything that the Logos is, God is. Everything God is, the Logos is. They're interchangeable. If there was an article there. Well, there isn't an article there. And that's important to recognize. And, you know, half the time, it's all just, it's all just a matter of terminology. And once you understand the terminology, you discover that scholars are just saying simple things. It's, it's good to demythologize scholarship. And that's really what education is. It's a demythologizing of scholarship. So this, you ready for theos here? This is a, an anarthrous pre-verbal predicate nominative. Wow. That, that, that sounds like you, you, you're really a smart person. <laughs> All that means is it doesn't have an article. It's before the verb, and it's a predicate nominative. That is, it's in the nominative. But since this is the subject, it is in the predicate, predicate predication, the verbal aspect of the sentence. Wow, that's not as complicated as it sounded, is it? And the problem is, very often, all of the conversation, people just sort of step away from and say, you know, I'm just, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what anarthrous pre-verbal predicate nominatives mean. But it's really not that difficult to figure out. So theos is anarthrous. And the big question is, why did John put it before the verb rather than after the verb? Why isn't it kai ha logos ein theos? Now, there are not a billion examples of anarthrous pre-verbal predicate nominatives in the New Testament to draw examples from. But thankfully, this sentence 
doesn't exist as a fragment someplace without the rest of the prologue to go with. And you can find enough examples in secular Greek and outside of this particular example to make the assertion that the reason you have this form is that having said that the Logos is eternal and having said that the Logos has eternally been in communion with Tom Theon, now what you're doing by putting Theos over here is you're saying, and the word was eternally Theos, deity. You're not identifying who the Logos is. You're identifying what the Logos is. And I believe that once you see this in light of the rest of the prologue, especially verse 18, this becomes clearly John's intention. But remember, anybody who says, oh, there needs to be an article here, does not understand the language. They do not understand what they're saying. If there was an article here, this would teach what's called Sabellianism. It would actually conflate the persons of the Trinity. This way it doesn't and allows John to describe the nature of the Logos.